Yeah, uh, it's this talk going to be very different from everything else you hear today or in your entire life. Uh, and I, I just don't know how to make it less different, so uh, I have to give it the way it goes. So, uh, structure resolution is something we're working in Dundee, and when I was speaking about uh, revolution and type inference, and we're aiming for revolution in resolution type of uh, resolution kind of methods. And uh, one thing we promised in this grant is maybe investigate a little bit whether revolution in structural resolution actually can say anything for revolution in type inference. And uh, we don't even know. Uh, well, and the more we learn, the less we know, I guess. So for Peng, who's going to come after me after the break, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our investigations, how structural re resolution can help uh, for type inference revolution. But I'll just concentrate on one revolution in my talk, and we'll try to explain why it is revolution and why it's important. So, um, and, re and resolution, I mean resolution like in prologue, it's SLB resolution, it's an automated proof method. So, um, I guess if you go from very afar, you could say that if you need to prove gamma, uh, A from uh, some set of assumptions, gamma, gamma maybe you see, you maybe it's your pro program, or I don't know what, uh, whatever you, you wish to think of at the moment, and you need to prove A from it, and then you have some proof method. You could think of uh, any method of this kind as being more or less structural. Uh, what does it mean to be structural? Well, constructive type theory is a nice example of, of extreme structural approach when if you want to prove A from gamma, you need to actually construct an inhabitant of type A and, so, and, and this P which we are constructing has some computational meaning. So I wonder if it's going to work. And what does it mean to be less structural? Well, prologue and resolution is about as, has about as little structure as you can imagine. Why is it? Well, in resolution methods, to prove A from gamma, you assume A is false, and then you run this resolution essentially is a proof by contradiction. So you run, 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 run. If you succeed and you get to an empty goal, you're done. But uh, if not, you basically don't know anything. And, um, and many people will say that, well, OK, there is a, there is a little bit of uh, you know, trade-off here. So if you want to be completely automated, it runs a uh, semi-decidable procedure, you lose a bit of this constructive feeling. And if you want to have rich types and so on, then you, you lose the same decidability. So um, and I'm trying to understand, well, do we really need more structure? And what, what is it, uh, what the structure that it will give us in automated proof search? So I'll try to illustrate it on this example. So on uh, your left, you see uh, a logic program. It defines a set of natural numbers and lists. It's actually the standard definition. So if you wanted, if I wanted to get a proof that list concepts y actually falls from this little theory there, uh, well, it essentially probably would assume that this is false, and then we'll try to resolve this with one of the clauses, we we'll resolve it with the fourth clause, and then we'll proceed to four sub clause and so on, and we'll eventually find some empty call and everything's fine. So, uh, and this is called refutation because it's finite. So if it's finite, it's all right. Then we have soundness and completeness, and whenever the solution is found, it's a sound solution. But um, then the problem is, what if we wanted to do more with it than just have those finite computations? Well, one, for one thing, uh, the problem arises when this thing doesn't terminate. So when it doesn't terminate, you don't know what it actually means. And uh, for a very long time, I don't know, from 70s and 80s, there was a trend of saying, well, if it doesn't terminate, then we just, you know, don't care, then some, some part, we, we really don't want to think about it. But let's um, think about it in a different way. So what are the reasons for uh, this proof search not to not to terminate? Well, one thing is that uh, because it's storage, so it's, and this, this I think relates to, to all the backtracking matters. If I just reorder it slightly in my third and fourth clause, I can actually force this procedure to never terminate, but it's not because I'm describing something funny or something productive. It's just because the storage goes like this. So I cannot say anything about this because I absolutely have, in this setting of prologue, because it's automated and just goes for an empty goal, but doesn't reach an empty goal, I have no other structures to, to deduce anything useful out of it. 
Okay, so the second thing is that obviously some programs may be intentionally non-inductive. So this is a co-inductive definition of the stream. It doesn't have this nil case as, uh, as we had in the previous example. So it's as if I'm actually meaning to define infinite streams. I don't want to have anything like finite lists in the previous slide. So again, this is intentionally doesn't terminate, but again, I have no means to reason about it. I also have no means to distinguish this non-termination from non-termination of the previous slide, where it was actually a non-termination for inductive definition. And um, the thing that concerns us the least, well, at the moment when we're talking about especially applications, this type inference is this famous problem that there is lack of directionality in in logic programming, in that when you're trying to compute this add, you're thinking of the third argument as if it was an output, but actually it can participate in unification as well. And even <coughs> the structurally recursive definition of add, you can have infinite computations. And again, they will be distinguished from the two other cases of non-termination. So, uh, so it happens that we kind of just, it's, it's, it's because there's nothing wrong with resolution and it's useful automated procedure. But the problem is that we just don't have enough of structures to help us to analyze what's going on in our research. So what does it mean that the program doesn't terminate? Maybe it's a recursive program like Stream, maybe it's a recursive program badly ordered. Maybe I want to have this co-inductive interpretation for, for lists and natural numbers. Maybe it's just some bug, so we have no idea what's going on in case of non-termination. So uh, these three problems basically at the moment non-distinguishable. Uh, Inductive definitions, co-inductive, or bad recursion, they all kind of the same as far as prologue is concerned. And if there is no termination, there is no problem analysis. So uh, we start to think, well, maybe there is some kind of missing link theory uh, in there. Maybe you can do resolution, but you can do it in a structural way. And uh, actually, the big picture, which I won't have time to tell you about today, we started giving algebraic semantics to prologue when we noticed that there are some three structures which are determined by, by the semantics, but these three structures is nothing like logic programming community knew before. So we had to formulate some kind of new calculus for, for what's going on, and we basically call this calculus as resolution. So this calculus looks very, very strangely, which doesn't look like anything you, you would see in either proof theory community or in prolog community. So uh, today I'll try to tell you just a little bit, we have to forget about algebraic semantics for today. I'll just try to tell you uh, as resolution as if this three-tier calculus of trees is the only thing I have. And if I have a little bit of time, I'll try to tell you the type theoretic semantics for this. But the hope is, um, as exotic as it is, when we are done with it, we'll have some kind of principally new methods to do automated proof search, which is a reform uh, what Prolog could do. So uh, one lesson is just really as a lesson, I'm not going to go into details. So uh, one lesson we learned that there is some structure, analyzing algebraically uh, syntax of horn clause uh, logic, you can get some structures out of it. And I'll try to tell you what is the, uh, what is our computation interpretation for those structures. So remember we're looking for some reform for standard proof search. And, uh, and we also had a hint on, on a little bit of structures um, arising in there, and we're trying now to formulate a calculus. We want to add more structures, but we don't want to add types, specifically types of modes in the language, because we want to use this untyped language as a type inference engine. So if I wanted to get some structure out of first order signature, what do I do? Well, the first thing to take is to remember I have the signature sigma, this first order signature. What can I do if I'm just given that? Well, for my example, uh, streams and natural numbers, signatures is, for example, this plus variables. Already at this level, I can have some information uh, about the signature. First, I can construct terms, <coughs> streams, uh, and I'm just using a standard way of defining terms <coughs> by defining uh, um, a tree language, L, uh, and then defining a term as a map from the tree language to signature plus variables. So this is more or less standard way to do this. Um, and this will allow us also to vary the size of the finite or infinite terms in principle. Um, by varying this tree language, we can vary terms without varying the actual signature. 
So the interesting law in this is that uh, this map should respect the IoT conditions. So if our S cons uh, had IoT two, then obviously in the domain language you should have a uh, parent zero and zero 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 one in the child. So the IoT here is determined by the IoT of terms. And notion of substitution arises here. To substitute, I just need to plug in some new term instead of variables x and y. And the calculus here is first order unification. And then I can introduce some notation about this. So set of all finite terms will be term, all infinite terms term, all the uh, term infinite term, all the all these kind of infinite terms. So this is my first tier of structures that arises there. Uh, well, what if I wanted to proceed and formulate a second tier of what's going on? And so this second tier of structures we have is actually suggested by algebraic semantics. Uh, so suppose now I'm building a new new kind of trees out of it. And well, it's again just using the same notation I'm defining trees, but this time my uh, uh, domain is L, but here I don't no longer have just signature, I'm using the term sigma which I've just defined in the first tier of structures. And plus I also need the notion of a clause and variables of new tier two. So these are kind of, think of it as a new world of structures. So we just defined one world of structures over terms and this is another world of structures. So what happens here is, uh, again, I have IDT conditions, but it's tier two IDT conditions, which are different from tier one IDT conditions. What are they? So here, the objects, obviously, can be either terms like this stream, or clauses like this clause three, or variables over clauses. And then the IDT is, <coughs> if I have a term, the IDT here should be the number of all the clauses I have. So I have three clauses, the IDT here is three. And if I have uh, a clause here, the IDT of this node will be two because I have two terms in that clause. Uh, and then you have a notion of substitution. In order to substitute this thing, you plug in new rewriting tree of this kind instead of variable. But they're called rewriting trees because they're not really using unification as you know it in Prolog. They're using term matching. So this tree in particular, you construct by matching this goal to some other uh, to, to, to a clause and then getting these sub goals, but this not x and stream y do not match to anything in there without your unification. And therefore, for this co-inductive program, your writing tree is finite. So we kind of we have a set of finite structures there, and we can have some kind of notation. Uh, basically mimicking the notation we had in tier one. So uh, that's that's what happened. We're at the moment only taking finite terms, finite rewriting trees. And then we get this third tier of structures where the objects, uh, the domain is again, we fix some domain, and then what we get is uh, the elements here are writing trees themselves. So you could think of this is one node in a derivation tree, this is another node, and this is another node, and so on. So you're building, so you, you remember that in the previous tier we had the situation when we could use the substitution, substitute new writing trees instead of these variables and proceed. So this is exactly what happens if I wanted to make derivation with this rewriting tree, I'm making substitution by, uh, by unifying one of these sub goals with one of the clauses. So for example, let's have a look. X3 not Y could be unified with not 0 or not um, SY1. And this is my way of, kind of making derivations, making transitions between the rewriting trees. So this, this whole set of structures you would wonder what it is going to in real life. Well, the one branch of derivation tree, the, the tier 3 tree, is, uh, is basically your one SLD derivation. So here you have, you started with your first tree, then you, for example, wanted to make some substitution in x, you, and you were able to extend this x2 with some new clauses and some sub wall and so on. So you're pre proceeding by uh, growing trees at your variables of tier 2. Uh, so we have kind of this, this wealth of structures going on in the resolution. And what do we need it for? Well, the funny thing is now we have as if some kind of a, a, a proof witness suddenly. So we started with some goal. We have to now, when we do the derivations, we proceed with constructing these rewriting trees. And when we succeed, like in this case, we have a proof witness. 
So if I wanted to say that, yes, indeed, I have this logic program and I was able to prove that least cons zero nil is actually a consequence, <coughs> I have now this branch in the derivation tree which ends with the proof weakness. So suddenly, it kind of, it, it's a lazy, think of it as, as making prologue lazy and having all these little observations of computations all the way and then getting some proof weakness. So this is, this is just an analogy, this is not yet a type or anything. And, uh, but, but we were able to explore actually whether there is any connection of this uh, to, to type theory. At the moment, just an analogy of, of kind of having something lazy and having observations and getting some completeness out of it. So uh, to, what does it give us to, to go into all these structures? We get many, many things for free suddenly, but just exploring this structural uh, wealth of, of even first order signature. To start with, uh, we could define this. The program is productive if it gives rise to writing trees of finest size. So this trap basically means it's all the writing trees of finest size. Uh, and this is something that logic programmers were not able to define for a very long time. This is universal productivity because I define this property factor to any logic program. Uh, and then, uh, if I wanted to do this, uh, to continue with this and massage a little bit how, what kind of properties I have for productive programs. I can have finite uh, inductive and co-inductive logic programs depending on the property of my trees on the tier 3. So tier 3 trees give you actually finiteness, uh, infiniteness or either and you can define what, what before logic programmers couldn't explain is what, what it means for a logic program to be inductive or co-inductive or finitely defined. We can now actually define this using the structures. So uh, this kind of remedies this picture. We can, in principle, distinguish all these three cases of non-termination <coughs> as being termination of an, uh, of being of having inductive program, co-inductive program, and uh, overall non-productive program, which is kind of a bad case of regression. So this allowed us to actually re-establish or establish for the first time a theory of universal productivity for logic programs. So to compare this with functional languages where you have recursive function for recursive function kind of terminating, non-terminating, productive or not, and this would be, say, a picture in Coco or Agda. Here we have a slightly, uh, well, crooked uh, picture where we have logic programs can be productive or not, and then among them they are inductively defined, and again among them some are productive and some are finitely defined. So we basically have now recovered uh, almost whole two thirds of, of this picture which I wanted to recover. How much time I have? Okay. Um, now, so the questions from here, so we played a lot with structures, we got some some nice structural representation across the language. So uh, what is the proof theoretic meaning of all of all that's going on? We kind of we found it is useful to, to have this all this analysis of all these different structures and one structure building up upon another. But um, Okay, what is the constructive content of this? What is this? What does it mean? So it, it was like a very nice analogy, but does it really have anything to recommend uh, itself in a more formal way? And uh, and how exactly this intuition that writing treats and with properties is can actually relate, relate us to type theory setting? So uh, it seems like I do have time to <coughs> tell you a little bit about this, which is good. So uh, let's now try to recover all that has happened with all these three structures into, um, and, and put it into chunky writing setting and in type theoretic setting. So let's consider again those rules for defining natural numbers and list of natural numbers, but we write them in a slightly different style, also giving some proper names to all the clauses. So obviously, as, as far as rewriting goes, you can distinguish a few ways of doing rewriting. So our rewriting trees that we discovered by giving quality price semantics to logic programs really resembles the term matching, uh, as people who do term writing systems uh, know. So in order to, if you have this as a set of sub goals and you want to make one rewriting step, you see if some AI matches with this C, and if it does, you substitute all this B1, Bns here as the as next sub goal. You can define by the same token unification reduction, but in this case, if you unify AI with C, you also need to apply the unifier to all, all other sub goals. So here, your matcher doesn't actually affect anything else because matcher only concerns substitution to 
to your kappa in, uh, in this set of axioms phi. Uh, and, and unification will actually affect everything else because unification will, um, will compute a substitution for both C and AI. And then you can also think, well, there is slightly strange something going on here. There is substitutional reduction. You take a unifier of AI and C and you don't do anything at all to your goals apart from applying some substitution. Well, it happens that what was going on in our structural setting and what wasn't going on in Prolog uh, is that, well, basically Prolog is this LP unique, so it's reduction by, by taking most genuine unifiers. Term rewriting systems uh, is, is this error where you have a term matching reduction. And structural resolution is something different. It's, uh, it's taking the fixed point of term matching reduction and then making one unification step and then repeating this and taking closure of this. So this is, this is, your, uh, this is where, in these places where you have productivity requirement, you would like to have this to be finite, this computation to be finite, and there where you have laziness, because after doing uh, some observation here in the writing tree, you were making one step, one transition of one writing tree to another. So uh, that's an example. So uh, if you do term matching reduction for this clause, <coughs> or for, for this goal rather, you, you do one step and then you have to stop because neither not x nor least y uh, actually term match with anything. So you kind of have a partial nature of this computation. And if you wanted to do the same with stream, uh, you would again by this partial nature of term matching, you only will have finite derivations for the co-inductive case of streams. So both this partial nature and finiteness reflect what was going on with tier two structures in our structural resolution. Okay, uh, and in our structural setting, obviously, because we don't want to have only partial computation, we do term matching reduction to not x uh, leads to y, and then we make some substitution, say, to not zero, and then we we proceed with making as many term matching steps as we can, and then we again make a substitution, and here we get the empty. Okay, and for streams, obviously this proceeds potentially forever, with, with the caveat that every term matching step that we make, this straight arrow step, will give you a finite observation. So it's not really a non-terminating computation, it's kind of, it, it, it has observational parts here, which are finite. Okay, uh, so that's that's the writing side of, of things. So what do we do if we wanted to put that as a as a calculus? So let's take terms, atomic formulas, Horn formulas, and proof terms, which are constant variables uh, in the applications or applications like this. So it's it's well known that resolution resembles cut. If we internalize this thing, so this rule is really the one that's important. We can actually represent all that's going on in Prolog using the types here. So if you wanted, uh, or, or rather, if, um, if you have proof term E1 and the type like here, and proof term E2 and the type here, you can represent another proof term by lambda A, lambda B, E2, B, E2, 1, A, to represent this cut of A, B that follows C. Uh, so this this little so it's 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 basically almost uh, Girard's uh, stuff about correspondence of resolution and cut rule, except for now it's internalized. The horn clauses are all on the type side, and proof terms are all on the left side. So uh, what happens here if we have a look at it? Well, that's again uh, a similar. Example here. Let's look at the example first, and then at uh, oh well, actually let's let's have a look at, at the theorems. So both uh, these reductions by LP and EF and LPTM are sound with respect to the type system. That is, if you have reductions to empty goal with uh, reductions by unification with empty goal and a substitution uh, gamma, then you can say that there definitely exists a proof term E such that uh, you have uh, a type of it of this shape for all x gamma A. And in a similar way, LPTM holds, uh, although you don't have this gamma any longer because it doesn't actually make substitution to your goal. So if we wanted to show this, uh, how it works, for, for example, for this B least. Uh, well, you make this reduction, you get your empty goal, and 
as a matter of fact, if you wanted to perform that in your in that little uh, lambda calculus you have, it will give you a proof term uh, of lambda a kappa four a kappa one kappa three, and you will notice obviously that we are making exactly the resolution steps with kappa four kappa one kappa three in the course of this derivation. So uh, this. This has analogy to what we have just uh, seen in the structural resolution with three tiers of structures that we had in the resolution. So if we wanted to take uh, the, res the structural resolution steps from least cons x, y to least cons 0, nil, we will stop here and we'll say, well, this particular rewriting tree observes for us some proof. And if you, if you want to compare this stuff, you will see that all well, that exactly tells you first that the first clause 4 was applied, that's kappa 4, then clause 3, that's kappa 3, and then clause 1, that's kappa 1. <coughs> so actually, in all these structures that you observed in three tiers, they, they do correspond for you for a proof term in, in this setting. Um, last thing, well, we have, we have proven that LP and EFA sound LPTM, but as you remember, structural deep resolution is not them, it's LP struct. To prove uh, that LP struct is equivalent to LP unif and then get the soundness of, uh, of structural resolution, we need to introduce this realizability transformation. That transforms your logic program into a new program, which basically you add another argument here that uh, records your proof, proof term. So let's have a look first at, at an interesting case, cup of four. If you have two sub goals here, and that's your standard B list, well, you add a third argument here to be least, introduce a new functional symbol and two new variables that run over the two sub goals you have. And if you had something with empty sub goal here, then you just introduce this proof constant. So this has uh, the, the couple two will have new function symbol and new variable that runs over only one proof obligation that gives that gives you and this gives you a, a constant uh, proof here for couple three. So if we wanted to make resolution steps, or structural resolution steps rather, for this transformed B list, what you will see at the end of the day is that this third argument in the course of resolution steps accumulates for you, so the substitution for this third argument accumulates for you exactly the proof term that you just had in your in the formulation in, in um, type time calculus formulation of this. So uh, it is this, this particular transformation of programs uh, really allows you to show that uh, a few things, actually. So first of all, this transformation guarantees uh, termination of term matching reduction, and this guarantees, therefore, productivity of your logic programs. Uh, it preserves provability that if something was provable in uh, SLD unification, it's still provable here. Uh, it records the proof in this extra argument uh, helps to prove operational equivalence of uh, standard prologue and uh, structural resolution. Uh, well, and uh, helps finally to prove soundness of structural resolution as well. So what happened here is the gains from, from doing all this complicated analysis of what is just known as prologue. So first we establish a direct relation to term writing for uh, structural resolution. We know now how to characterize this, uh, that as lambda calculus. We, uh, we know that it's sound, uh, the structural resolution is sound. We know how to record the proof weakness in all this story because structural by, by all those three tiers of trees is one thing and structural by actually constructing a proof term is another thing. So many things are actually directly inherited from the three tier calculus we had and do translate into, into the under calculus representation. So, uh, we have recovered now this full picture with the third lesson that we can actually transform the structural lessons we've learned in 3 t 3 calculus to, to the type theoretic semantics of what's going on. So basically, and this is this is our ABC of, of the structural revolution for, for, for resolution kind of methods. We want to penetrate deeper into the structures of, of this and it's, it's not just like a theoretical exercise, we really need more structures in order to be able to talk about co-recursion, productivity and so on. And we now have actually a way to 
while doing storage in B because it's very powerful for storage all these all these three kinds of trees, being able to recover a proof witness for what's going on in this in this tree calculus of um, of item B. So Fu Peng is uh, well, might might tell you a bit more in his talk, but he's investigating applications of what we have just seen to type inference. So imagine now that it's not your prolog program, but it's um, it's type class inference problem. And uh, working with having all these tools of analyzing the structure of derivations when you start making this inference may be really, really useful, especially this by, by the last few slides I showed you. Uh, you can actually record that uh, by evaluating this, you can get a proof from couple two, couple one. So every time you can, you can extract a proof witness by now also getting richer methods to analyze <coughs> non-termination and doing kind of this lazy uh, evaluation of, um, of things. So um, dreams for the future of maybe exploring how this structural view of standard resolution methods may affect other automated proving methods. And um, thank you very much. There are efforts of many people in, in this. Their names are included. Yes, indeed. So with this, with these uh, observations, um, we can form we can form some kind of co-inductive hypothesis and co-inductive conclusion. So if you look at this, so this is an inductive case. We got the full proof. <coughs> but imagine this is stream, and so you proceed with finite observations like this to infinity in this horizontal level. So by noticing uh, that this tree consumes uh, these cones in the course of, and suppose it's not least, it's a stream. So it consumes these cones here and produces it when it forms substitutions here. And then it consumes that same cones here and maybe produces it again. We're able to formulate on the basis of this co-inductive hypothesis and co-inductive conclusions on the structures that arise in this vertical level and horizontal level. And by this, what you get at the end of the day, at some point, if it was an infinite computation, I would be able to say stop here and say, well, I can close my co-inductive conclusion by noticing some invariant in consumption of consensus here in production of consensus there. So we, we have a method that soundly does it and says, well, this last observation is a, is a sound observation. And then the Pen's method with lambda terms come here, and you can actually say that it's not just one tree that I soundly observed. Actually, this tree has a lambda uh, term representation of a proof. So yeah, we're recovering it through uh, through structural analysis of trees to stop it because you need to know the thing is because there is inductive and co-inductive components in computations you really don't know when, when to finish your co-inductive your infinite computation so you have to have complex conditions when it's sound to say in this, this observation is sound it may be after 10 steps like this it may be after 20 depending what is going on in, in how, how induction and co-induction is introduced but here we do have a method of stopping this stuff, saying it's sound to stop the infinite thing here, and that this little term approximates uh, at infinity and infinite term. So that's, I didn't have time, on, and, and it's good that I didn't have time to tell about that today, but yeah, we have this, this method. Um, so you, this is applied to logic programming and prolog and gives this constructive um, information about it, but you also said it's related to term rewriting. Does it, do these ideas add any new insights into term rewriting languages? Yeah, we're looking at it uh, extensively, and it seems like this is just richer in terms of methods we have because because of all this. So this is only so this is tier two structures. One then also analyze structures of this. This is this actually is a term T in the system and you can analyze the, the term structures as well and then derivation structures. So it seems like in terms of search for different structures that arise in, in, in co-inductive 
for inductive computations were a bit richer than what term generating systems do, but were also more dynamic than what they do, because very often in term generating systems they analyze termination or productivity by looking at term generating systems statically, and we kind of we, we run this stuff to, to get the properties of termination or non-termination. Yeah, how do you make the distinction between what's inductive and what's going inductive? Because given the rules that you had at the beginning, maybe you were describing codaps rather than maps. Yes, so that's a good, I mean, it's, it's great, and it's, it's good that for inductive definitions we can do this, right? I can, I can think of an inductive definition as a, as a point up, I can think of not definition, gives me an infinite natural number actually, as well as finite. So, uh, well, one answer is that I, I can, for the first time for logic programming, I can actually give a formal definition of what it means to be inductive and what it means to be co-inductive. And I use the size of the TF3, so derivation trees is a TF3 trees. I can actually characterize inductiveness and co-inductiveness by saying, well, if your program is inductive, then it can have finite or infinite derivation trees. Derivation trees are those trees which uh, arise from transitions from one rewriting tree to another. And if, like for stream, you can only have infinite derivation trees, then it's co-inductive. And therefore, you have this slightly crooked picture compared to functional programming, when sort of <coughs> everything is inductive to start with. So if you have NAT, you can interpret it inductively and co-inductively, but if you have stream, it's sitting somewhere here, it, can, it is only co-inductive. So this, this really arises from honest study of, of structures. So just by looking at what kind of structures you have and their properties, you get this crooked picture. But it's an, you know, it's an honest approach. We didn't try to contrive anything or design something that would suit, say, functional picture there. We just kind of, we just try to really go with what structures arise in the process of the signature, what they give you. And they give you a slightly different picture from when you have, when you can actually type your function and say, well, I'm defining now recursive function and I'm defining now co-recursive function because when you work on pop or agda, you can actually declare a type as inductive or co-inductive or declare a function as recursive or co-recursive. Whereas here, without typing anything, you can recover basically a co-inductive, co-inductive type by just looking at structures that, that lead a normal three tiers. I know it's, it's, it's absolutely exotic thing, and, to, and the funny thing is to whichever audience I present it, it's always exotic. Last week I presented it to a algebraic audience and it, it looks as exotic to them as it looks to you. But maybe because it's so exotic it will give rise to something new and interesting if, if someone looks into it. So Tom agreed to look into it and a few other people agreed to look into it. So maybe, maybe not, maybe we won't find anything interesting in the end. But so far it's promising, the more we dig into it, the more nice interesting structural properties we get. And first we thought we just have these three structures at different levels and then we were able to recover lambda terms out of it and so on. So the more we dig into it, the more we find it seems. Thank you.